Our sermon this morning for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 21 to 28. The sermon is entitled, Why Jesus? Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now Jesus says, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, Jesus is the Christ, from the Greek word Christus, the anointed one, the one set apart to be Jesus, the one who will save people from their sins. And Jesus says to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As you know, this confession is rooted in the rock of Christ, the rock that will not be overcome by Satan and his minions, this rock that destroys the big death in your lives, this rock that mends the chasm that has happened ever since the fall. For Jesus Christ is the rock, the cornerstone of this church. So Peter's faithful confession, what a perfect confession it was. Because his confession answered correctly and to the point, why Jesus? Because there in Christ, you have the true treasure, the abundant life given by his very own sacrifice. Knowing the why in Jesus Christ alone is so important. And Peter, at that moment, seemed to know it all. He seemed to have everything in his heart and mind, perfect by the word of the Lord. Yet as we know, the disciples had a lot to learn. The Lord would teach them the foretelling of his own death and resurrection, not once, not twice, but thrice, three times. He would remind them that because he is the Christ, Because he is the true Son of God, he would bear the ultimate cross for your sins. His mission as a Christ was to, as John the Baptist would proclaim, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, the one who stands in your place because you cannot stand for yourself in front of God. Jesus, your redemption for you. But this Jesus says, he has come to suffer in this short time that he has in this world. Yes, we see Peter after hearing Jesus' words, the foretelling of his death and resurrection. You would think he would say, yes, O Lord, we will follow you. But no, his reaction is telling He responds and he rebukes the Lord. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Now, as any good Lutheran would ask, what does this mean? Right? You would ask that? Good. What does Peter's response reveal about who he believes that Jesus Christ is Lord? What does this mean to him? Now at that time, as he views Jesus, he saw this great teacher, this rabbi, the Messiah, who should be gloried, revered, honored, praised, loved, looked up to, welcomed in this world with open arms. Peter believed that Jesus should not suffer at all. He should not be betrayed into the hands of men. That Jesus should not suffer, be whipped, spat upon bleeding and suffering upon the cross, shedding his body and blood, wearing the crown of thorns, scoffed, scorned, ridiculed. He doesn't deserve any of this, or so Peter thought. 
Peter wanted Jesus, as all the disciples wanted, for Jesus to be with them, to be with them for a very long time. It was a great source of comfort knowing that their teacher could be with them, teaching, performing miracles, doing all these things in front of their very own eyes. But it always comes down to the question, why Jesus? Why is Jesus the Christ? Why did our Savior, our true grace, make his way into the world? Did Jesus come to the world to simply be a life coach? Did Jesus come to the world to give you morality, to show you the way to earn your way to salvation? Did Jesus come to simply parade his power and show people how powerful we, he was in performing these miracles. Now, Peter, he was well-intentioned, right? He was, he was looking out for Jesus in his own human reason. But his mind was not set on the things of God, but his mind was set on the things of man. He rebuked the Lord. He rebuked God. Think about that, right? Jesus knew who was behind these words from the lips of Peter. And he addressed him quickly. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says. You are a stumbling block, a hindrance, or as in the Greek, the scandalon, a, a scandal, one that impedes the way of the will of the Lord. And by human reason, Peter wanted only what was best for Jesus, but the Lord knew what was best for all of humanity. And he had something else in mind. For to be Lord of all is to die for all. From the snake to the cross to the crown to his death and resurrection, this is why Jesus is truly the Christ, that he is truly your Lord. Yes, there were many things that Jesus was to face in the time to come of his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection. But likewise for the disciples, they were to face many things as well as followers of Christ. And Jesus says in our text, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yet yeah, being a believer in Christ is not the easy way. It is the narrow way. It is a way in which the world does not want to go. Because as a Christian, we face the apocalyptic battle. The battle with the devil, the battle with our sinful flesh, the persecutions, the temptations, the spiritual attacks. This world does not want to address the devil always assailing us with every source of temptation. The target is on your backs, folks. So Jesus says, deny yourself, right? Deny yourself. In other words, do not trust in yourself. Do not trust in the world or your flesh because you are battling a different battle. You're battling not what is of flesh or what is of the world or what is of our human reason, or human circumstance, but you are battling the spiritual forces of darkness. And therefore, he urges his disciples to trust, to deny themselves, to take up the cross, and trust the Lord in their heart and mind, living the life in God's name, knowing that they're in baptism. Yes, they have been called to be his own, grafted in his name, but knowing that the, in the Christian life, there are many crosses to bear. Many crosses. Jesus poses a great question that points to a great temptation in all of our lives. What good is it for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his own soul? What good is it when we go our own way, seeking glory, 
self-fulfillment, self-satisfaction, gratification, all centered on the idolatry of self. Rather than denying ourselves and following the Lord, that the Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want, but yet how many times do we want the things of this world? When Jesus says, deny ourselves, these sinful wants and desires, they lurk in our hearts and minds. And like Peter, all too many times, we have our minds set on the ways of man. The devil, meanwhile, says to you, let it all go. Don't bear those crosses. Don't live the life of suffering as Christians. But live the way you please. The same words given to our first parents, Adam and Eve. Go and eat, and you will not die. You will be like God. You will know like him. They went and ate and fell to Satan's temptation. Thus, we're here, born all into sin. The consequence of the fall, and though, as we know as Christians, the victory has been won. In every breathing moment, we still face the flesh, the devil, the world that still do their work, tempting us by our own glory, trusting ourselves, living a life that is pleasing to the flesh rather than pleasing to God. You know, Marjorie read our, she beautifully read our epistle reading in Romans 12. The love in action, she said, I believe, right? Love in action. This is the life we're called to live, to love one another, right? Unconditionally. Unconditionally to love one another, to hate what is evil, to be devoted to one another, to have honor for others above yourself, to have spiritual thirstiness, fervor, rather than spiritual lethargy, to share and love to those who are in need, to live without conceit. This is our call. These are many things that we ought to bear, these crosses that are commanded by our Lord. But yet the old Adam in ourselves, our sinful nature, we see those things and sometimes we say, yes, I'm going to do those, but yet so many times, it seems our own motivations are underneath. So we must ask ourselves, do we truly honor one another? Do we hunger for God's word? Do we love and place people's welfare before ourselves? Do we love our enemies? Do we love our enemies unconditionally? Or does resentment continue to stew in our hearts and minds? The list goes on and on. And again, this is the battle that we face. The world says you are number one in your life. So let those crosses go. Do as you please, right? Don't deny yourself. Don't bear the crosses. Follow your own way. Whether it's money, whether it's reputation, whether if it's loving yourself above other people, and most importantly, above God, do what you need to do to have comfort. Peter is our example of self-reliance. He thought he knew more than he really knew. He thought he could trust his own words, his own strength, as he rebuked the Lord. As we know, Peter, what does he say when Jesus predicts his death and resurrection countless times in the New Testament? Though they all fall away, Peter says, I will never fall away, right? Even if I must die for you, I will never deny you. But what do we hear? All we could hear is the rooster crowing, right? All we could hear is Peter falling as he says, I do not know this man, Jesus. Like Peter, we think we know what's best, but at the end of the day, we fail. And though we fail, Jesus does not. 
For his mission is set on the things of God and not on the things of man. His mission was set on the glory of God and not on the glory of man. His mission was set on the will of the Father and not on the will of man. And that will of the Father is to be your Savior, to be the answer to the question, why Jesus? He doesn't come to save his own life or to seek refuge in this world, but he comes into the world to be your refuge, to save your life. As he dies on the cross and three days later he takes it up again. St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is your Lord. That is why Jesus, the one who knew no sin, who became sin for you, so that in him you might have the righteousness of God, that you are right with God, right? No matter what we say to the Lord, to prove our worth, to show how great we are, nothing can give us salvation in ourselves. But it is Jesus. It's why we believe that Jesus is the Christ, that in Him, by His merits upon the cross, He suffered. He suffered the most painful death for you. The world was against him, mad at him. Jesus could have become angry, but what does Jesus say? He says, Father, forgive them, right? For they do not know what they do because he is your acceptable sacrifice for you. Yes, our Lord, he is faithful. He is love. He is the good shepherd who puts everything on the line, his own very life, as the lamb who is sent to the slaughter for you. Why, Jesus? Because he did not come to the world to seek profit for himself, for his own benefit, but he came to be your payment for your sins. He paid the price to gain the world, right? He paid the price to gain the world that was once lost and now that was regained by his redemptive sacrifice, not by silver or gold, but by the precious, holy body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the all-redeeming grace that Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve. How? As a ransom for many. And that ransom he pays for the prophet, not for himself, but for you. His death, his resurrection, for forgiveness, eternal life, and salvation. And you must always ask yourself, as you live the daily grind in this world, as this world is so rapid and quick and fast, and so many times we must always ask ourselves as we go back to the world, to the word of God, can this world overcome death for you? All this world has to offer, can this world overcome your death? Can this world wash away your sin? Can this world give you all the prophets in the world to give you the assurance and comfort of life, forgiveness, and salvation? And the answer is no, right? Why Jesus? Because he is the only Christ. There's no other way, no other truth, no other life. But there is Jesus, the author and perfecter, the finisher of your faith, as he has brought you true victory. Yes, we we try to bear the crosses in our life. We, we try to deny ourselves in faith as we live according to his word, but yet we fall. But today we take comfort knowing that Jesus does not fall, but he rises. He breaks the grave and shows you the empty tomb that proves that all has been finished. All by his grace you are redeemed. No stumbling block, no hindrance or scandal could get in the way of Jesus because he is your Redeemer, your Savior, your true Lord, the Christ, 
the faithful one who bore the ultimate cross, so that you all may have life in his name. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com.